Well, thank you very much indeed um, for the introduction. So my name is Sydney Tang and I'm from Hong Kong. Uh, I just want to start by thanking Irina, um, Professor Irina Sakharova, if I have pronounced it correctly, for the very kind invitation. And uh, it's a, a great pleasure for me to speak at the Russian Dollar Society. I have not been to Moscow or any part of Russia before. So even if this is online, I feel really privileged. And I hope that in the future, I will be able to visit um, Moscow or Russia in person. So my task today will be to talk about um, the KDGO uh, updated guidelines on glomerular diseases. This is the 2021 update um, uh, from KDGO, and these are my disclosures. So as many of you may know, KDGO published the first guideline on the management of glomerular diseases back in 2012. Um, and uh, the latest guideline is just published two months ago uh, online and by print last month. So I just want to say something about the timeline of guideline. So although the guideline was published in 2021, actually uh, KDGO envisaged the need to update the 2012 guideline back in 2017. And it started with a controversy conference held in Singapore and followed by rounds and rounds of meeting. I think there were at least uh, two face-to-face uh, -face work group meetings, followed by a number of uh, endless number of email communications and also subgroup discussions. And I think you would see from this time timeline that the first draft of the uh, guideline actually went to public consultation in the middle of 2020. Here, uh, 1st of June 2020 for public consultation. And after gathering the comments from the public and for review and for revision uh, and so on, the guideline was actually finally published a year later in 2021. So this is the uh, guideline that went online on September 20th, 2021, uh, which, is, which is two months ago. And you can see that two days after the guideline first appeared online, there were 21,000 uh, uh, views on the guideline. It reached actually 30,000 people on Facebook with over 4,500 engagements. And there were 53,000 impressions on Twitter uh, with over 3,500 engagements. Uh, the whole guideline is actually a 276 page printed pages of documents. So this is a very big document. It's actually the uh, 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 biggest uh, KDG guideline that has ever been published. And therefore in the next um, 25 minutes or 30 minutes or so, I won't be able to cover every aspect of this guideline. And so therefore what I plan to do would be to cover some of the primary uh, global uh, nephritis uh, covered by the guidelines. So this is a classification of glomerular disease, either by primary or secondary causes or histologically by its proliferative or non-proliferative changes on microscope. So I think uh, I would just dedicate my time to talk about IgA nephropathy, which is the commonest primary glomerular disease worldwide, certainly in this part of the world. And uh, also the some of the uh, non-proliferative glomerular diseases, including minimal change disease, focal segmental, and also membranous nephropathy. So I think the first practice point from the KDQ guideline is that the kidney biopsy, as of 2021, is still the gold standard for diagnosing and evaluating glomerular disease. However, the 2021 guideline has given a provision that under circumstance, some circumstances, treatment may actually proceed without a kidney biopsy confirmation of diagnosis. And I will tell you a bit more about this later. So this is just a reminder of what we do during a kidney biopsy. So the nephrologist would always want to aim for the kidney cortex of the kidney during a kidney biopsy, uh, most likely performed under ultrasound guide, real-time ultrasound guidance these days. And we want the cortex because if we look at this, the cortex is where the gloms are situated. And the medulla is where the tubule and the loop of handy and the collecting that is situated. And therefore, for the diagnosis of glomerular diseases, we really want to biopsy the cortex. So this is just a revision of the kidney histology. So on the cortex, the pathologist will perform H and E staining. And you can see that this is a glomerulus. And you would see that on the H and E staining, the proximal tubule would appear a little bit more eosinophilic. And the distal tubule would appear a little bit paler. 
So uh, there is also another staining which you want to perform, which is the silver staining. The silver staining is nice because it actually outlines the basement membrane very well. So here you can see the glomerular capillary basement membrane, the Bauman capsules basement membrane, and the tubular basement membrane very well. And we can actually make use of the orientation of cells to the basement membrane to identify cells. For example, here you see a cell inside the glomerular capillary loop. So this is an endothelial cell. This is another endothelial cell here inside the capillary lumen. And if you see a cell lying outside the um, capillary basement membrane, this will be a podocyte as shown here. And here we see a cluster of cells in between capillary loops. And these are cells forming a structural support for the glomerular capillary loops. And these are the mesangial cells. So by performing the silver stain, we can actually identify the various uh, intraglomerular cells. So these are the various standard uh, uh, staining and processing of uh, kidney histology on uh, light microscopy. We can do H and E, PAS staining, silver staining, Congo red staining, and so on. And on the immunofluorescence, the pathologist would look for complement deposition, immunoglobulin, and also copper and lambda chains. And on electron microscopy, one would look for protocyte effacement, integrity, basement membrane thickness, and also the presence of electron dense deposits. So the H and E staining as shown here, the nuclei are stained dark blue by the H and E stain, and the cytoplasm is stained eosinophilic. And here you can see that the H and E staining will give you a very good idea to show where the lesion is. Are cells very abundant? For example, here you can see some cells because you see the dark blue staining. And here you see a uh, a fading of the eosinophilic staining of the cytoplasm without cells. So these are areas of fibrosis without cells on a low power. And here uh, you would see that a detailed assessment of the glom by H and E staining is actually not possible. One would only be able to give a general idea of what the kidney biopsy is like, whether or not there are excessive cells or fibrosis and so on. So let me move on to the first patient I would present, a 27-year-old male who presented 10 years ago to our clinic with bilateral pitting and coedema with a normal blood pressure. The urine dipsticks showed four plus protein and the serum creatinine was 84 micromoles per liter or around one milligram per DL. Serum albumin is 33 and the 24 urine protein was 5.2 grams. All the immune markers and the viral hepatitis serologies were negative. And the biopsy was performed for this patient, the kidney biopsy here, showing a relatively normal looking glom without increase in cells. So this is a relatively normal looking glomerulus on the biopsy. And here is the electron microscopy showing the normal appearance on the uh, upper panel for comparison. This is not from the patient, but the panel B is actually from the patient. And you would see that there is actually gross podocyte effacement and the transmission EM actually also showed a disappearance of these primary, secondary and tertiary uh, processes of the podocytes replaced by complete effacement. So I'm sure you would know that this patient, this young man is actually suffering from minimal change disease. And the KDCO 2021 guideline provided a recommendation that high-dose corticosteroids should be considered for initial treatment of minimal change disease. The dosage would be one milligram per kilogram up to 80 milligram per day for four weeks or equivalent route. And tapering should be begun two weeks after complete remission over at least a six-month period. And during high-dose corticosteroid therapy, we also need to consider uh, treatment emergent toxicity and provide prophylaxis where appropriate, including pneumococcal, carinia, pneumocystis, uh, pneumonia uh, prophylaxis, peptic ulcer prophylaxis. And in uh, many parts of China where hepatitis B is still endemic uh, for patients who are hepatitis B positive, we also provide hepatitis B uh, antiviral drug prophylaxis. So the guideline also suggested that for patients who do not want to receive corticosteroid or in patients who have contraindications to corticosteroid, that one can consider cyclophosphamide, calcineurine inhibitor, or a low-dose corticosteroid plus uh, sodium microphenolate. So this is a recent study from our group uh, using uh, low-dose corticosteroid and sodium microphenolate for the treatment of primary GN by primary minimal change disease. 
Uh, this is a randomized controlled trial, an open label study, and you can see that uh, over a period, period of more than five years, actually, in our center, we recruited around 20 patients with minimal change disease, de novo, naive, no treatment given before, and these patients all had uh, six gram of proteinuria. So these patients are frankly nephrotic with hypoalbuminemia, as shown here. And these patients were randomized to receive either standard dose corticosteroid or a half dose steroid plus mycophenolate. And you can see that after one year's treatment, that the combination of low dose steroid and MMF uh, was actually non inferior to standard dose. And we, uh, it would also be important to note that in the group of patients who receive mycophenolate, they have much lower steroid uh, related uh, side effects. So the story actually continued for the patient. The patient was actually given standard dose cortical steroid for 16 weeks without improvement. Uh, the body weight has further increased because of increasing edema and the repeated 24-hour urine uh, also showed a high-grade proteinuria that has not really remitted. And the kidney function remains more or less the same. So the differential diagnosis, I'm sure all of you would know, would perhaps be a, a lesion that is missed by the initial biopsy because we know that uh, this patient has a, a, a serum albumin of 33. So this patient actually had focal segmental glomerulosclerosis on a repeat biopsy, and the PAS staining showed this very nicely. The PAS or the periodic acid shift, shift stain actually stains the basement membrane and the PAS positive materials such as proteins or glycogen. And here you can see that in this glomerulus, there is actually a segmental lesion, meaning that only part of the glom, around 50% of the glom is affected by this sclerosis, whereas the remaining half is completely normal. And on a lower power survey, you would also this, see this focal distribution, meaning not all gloms were affected by this sclerotic changes. And the mesome trichrome staining showing here uh, uh, fibro fibrotic tissue, which appeared in blue, uh, also a partial fibrosis and periglomerular fibrosis. The lower power view also showed interstitial fibrosis, this kidney biopsy. So this patient actually had focal segmental sclerosis that was not picked up by the initial biopsy, probably because of sampling error. So the KDGO 2021 guideline actually recognized that focal segmental glomerulosclerosis is actually not a single disease. It is a pattern of injury, which could be due to a variety of causes apart from primary form of FSGS, Patients could have genetic FSGS, for example, as a result of mutation in some of the sleep diaphragm proteins, or secondary causes such as due to viral infections, such as HIV, drug-induced causes, or other processes leading to glomerular hyperfiltration causing secondary focal segmental sclerosis. And lastly, there could be FGS of undetermined origin. So in terms of uh, treatment, uh, this algorithm shows that for patients with frank nephrotic syndrome, meaning proteinuria more than 5, 3.5 gram per day, and serum albumin less than 30 with or without edema, uh, and also in the presence of diffuse food process effacement on the electron mic microscopy, these patients are likely to be suffering from primary FSGS, and therefore it will be appropriate for, to treat these patients with immunosuppression. And if they do not display a response, one would really need to consider other causes and perform a genetic test. So for patients without the frank nephrotic syndrome, meaning for patients with nephrotic range proteinuria, but serum albumin more than 30, or in patients with subnephrotic range of proteinuria without hypoalbuminemia, we would really have to consider secondary causes. And one of the practice points in the guideline suggests that adults with FGS who do not have nephrotic syndrome should really be evaluated for secondary causes and not be treated blindly with immunosuppression, which could induce a lot of side effects without inducing remission of the proteinuria. So the treatment for primary FSGS would be a recommendation for the use of high-dose cortical steroid at the, as the first-line treatment, and these are the recommended dosages listed here. And once again, we would have to be aware of steroid-related side effects as shown in this box here. And for adults who actually do not uh, respond well to cortical steroid, uh, the recommendation would be for uh, the inclusion of a calcineurine inhibitor for at least 12 months to minimize uh, the risk of relapse, or in patients who are resistant or intolerant to calcineurin inhibitors, uh, 
the consideration of a repeat biopsy or the enrollment into a clinical trial. We would note that in recent years, there have been a number of uh, RCTs in uh, 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 focal segmental disease. And I just want to briefly talk about the duplex study. Uh, this is the duplex trial using Sparsantan, which is a selective dual acting antagonist of two receptors, the angiotensin type 1 receptor and the endothelin type A receptor. So this is the study design. So patients would be washed out for two weeks with a discontinuation of RAS blockers. Uh, the reason for discontinuation of RAS blocker is really because Sparsantin actually contained uh, an angiotensin receptor blocker. So these patients will be randomized to receive Sparsantin or uh, just uh, 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 Erbizartan. And then these patients will be followed for uh, endpoints and uh, the study was planned to uh, include 300 patients. And as of um, two months ago, around 190 patients actually completed uh, 36 weeks of follow-up. And uh, the interim analysis uh, has been performed. And this is the um, press release by Trevier uh, showing the proportion of patients achieving a reduction of urine protein creatinine ratio to less than 1.5 gram per gram of proteinuria with more than 40% reduction in protein creatinine ratio was actually 42% in the Spasantan group versus only 26% uh, in the uh, control Erbisartan group. So this is a, uh, a promising signal to suggest that Spasantan could have important or significant anti-proteinuric effect in patients with uh, focal segmental disease. There is another study coming up, uh, which will be sponsored by Dimerix using uh, Dimerix 200, which is a repergermanium, which is a CC chemokine receptor type 2 blocker that would uh, inhibit the recruitment of monocytes uh, implicated in the inflammatory cytokine environment of chronic kidney diseases, including focal segmental disease. Um, the uh, study will be a multi-center phase three, phase three trial, and there will be three sites in Hong Kong, and this trial will be conducted uh, uh, worldwide. Okay, let me move on to the next patient, who is a 23-year-old patient who is referred for the evaluation of painless gross hematuria after sore throat with slightly high blood pressure, serum creatinine around 55, and urine uh, analysis showing uh, numerous red blood cells, 24-hour urine protein showing 1.4 grams of protein, and the patient was actually not receiving any medication. So I think my students would actually tell me that this patient will, would most likely be suffering from IgA nephropathy because of this phenomenon, which we call sympharyngitic uh, gross hematuria. And indeed, the patient actually had IgA nephropathy. So the guideline for IgA nephropathy was actually led by John Barrett from Leicester, UK. And I was uh, one of the uh, members in the writing group for IgA nephropathy. So the practice point for diagnosis actually says that IgA N as of 2021 can only be diagnosed histologically with a kidney biopsy and that there are no validated serum or urine markers for IgA nephropathy. So the patient underwent a biopsy and you would see that this patient's biopsy showed increase in the number of mesangial cells as opposed to the normal included here for comparison. And if more than 50% of the gloms showed such a degree of mesangial uh, proliferation, uh, this patient would be classified as having an M1 lesion on the MESC Oxford classification. And of course, we would also need a dominant or co-dominant IgA deposition on the IF for us to make the diagnosis of IgA nephropathy. So clinical and histologic data at the time of biopsy can actually be used uh, uh, for prediction of outcome. So therefore, the practice point in the guideline also suggested for uh, using an international prediction tool to uh, uh, predict the prognosis in patients with IgA nephropathy at the time of biopsy. And this is the original paper published in JAMA Internal Medicine. The first author is Sean Barber from Canada. And he used three cohorts from the European Valiga cohort, the Nanjing China cohort, and the Tokyo Japan uh, cohort. And the validation cohort also included uh, patients from the original Oxford uh, derivation and validation cohort, Beijing cohort, and the Japan Fukuoka cohort, and you would see an agreement between the derivation and the validation cohorts.
So to cut short a long story, so this tool is now available online and you can just type QDM mix uh, and IGAN and you would have this uh, prediction tool and you need to enter these parameters um, to arrive at a prediction score. So let's try this on the patient we saw with uh, proteinuria 1.4 gram and M1 lesion. And so here you see that uh, the patient's GFR is normal, the patient is Chinese. At the time of biopsy, uh, the uh, degree of proteinuria is one gram, blood pressure is here. And you can also then therefore using these parameters to generate a risk of progression to kidney failure or 50% reduction in GFR in five years. And you can actually say three years, four years or five years, but usually we can just enter 60 months. So the patient had a 11.4% risk of progression. If the patient had been on a RAS blocker, you remember that the patient was not on any medication. So if she had been on a RAS blocker and still had one gram proteinuria, of course, the risk of progression in five years would increase. And if there were E and S lesions, the um, uh, risk is actually not much altered, meaning that the E and S lesion do not cast a, a very significant difference on prognosis. I think the most important parameter to look at will be the T lesion, because if the patient had a T1 lesion, the risk would be doubled from 11% to 24%. If the patient had a T2 lesion, the risk uh, would be tripled to 38%. What about ethnicity? Well, I don't have the data here. Oh, the data is shown here. So if the patient had been a Japanese patient, the risk will be reduced to 28%. If the patient was a Caucasian, the risk would further be reduced to 20%. So it's suggesting that for the same uh, uh, parameters, histologically and clinically, uh, Chinese patients would actually have the highest risk of progression, followed by Japanese and Caucasians. And note that these cohorts were actually derived from um, Japan, China, and Europe. So the uh, 2021 KDGO guidelines suggestion for treatment, of course, would be for at least three months of what we call optimized supportive care, meaning BP management, um, maximally tolerated doses of RAS blocker, lifestyle modification to achieve blood pressure systolic less than 120, salt restriction to less than two grams of sodium a day, weight management, and smoking cessation if applicable. And then, of course, uh, you would also see that if the patient does not respond to three months optimized supportive care with residual proteinuria more than 0.75 gram a day, one can actually perform uh, consider other forms of treatment as shown here. And you can see a special population box come up, coming up here that for Chinese patients, one can actually consider steroid therapy and mycophenolate therapy. So I'll just say something about steroid therapy. I think the first report of steroid therapy actually uh, came from uh, uh, POTSI's group uh, in Italy, and also more recently from, uh, uh, from the testing trial in China. So for patients who remain at high risk, meaning with proteinuria and still more than one gram a day of protein, after at least three months of optimized care, these patients can be considered for a six month course of corticosteroid. And the data was actually uh, coming from the original testing trial published in JAMA four years ago, showing an improvement, uh, uh, six, more than 70%, a uh, 60% improvement uh, in the uh, methylprednisolone group. And one would actually note that, as I've said before, that treatment with high-dose corticosteroid may be associated with side effects, especially infective side effects. And therefore, despite the encouraging result from the original testing trial, the trial was actually prematurely terminated because of a nearly five-fold increase in the risk of developing serious adverse events, mainly infective pneumonia adverse events in the trial. So the testing low-dose study was actually designed to uh, uh, actually improve the treatment designs and the result of the testing low dose trial was actually published, uh, not, yet, not yet published. I mean, it was actually presented at the uh, ASN Kidney Week uh, about two weeks ago, and I just want to share the data. So this is the testing low dose study uh, presented, uh, I think on the 5th of November by uh, Vla uh, Vlado Pakovic 
So uh, this is just to remind you of the methylprednisolone dosages that for the full dose protocol is around 0.6 to 0.8 milligram per kilo, up to 48 milligrams per day of methylprednisolone. And this is reduced to around 24 to 32 milligram per day of methylprednisolone. Importantly, the reduced dose protocol incorporated prophylaxis against pneumocystis pneumonia. So the baseline characteristics are over 500 patients randomized, and you can see that these patients, they all had high grade, two, over two gram a day of proteinuria and also active lesions on the kidney biopsy. And the main result actually showed that after 4.2 years medium follow-up, that there was a 47% reduction in the risk of developing the composite of kidney failure 40% reduction in EGFR or death due to kidney disease. And this is highly statistically significant. And this is by protocol, you would see that for both the full dose and the reduced dose protocol, that there was a reduction in the risk of uh, reaching the endpoint, uh, which is actually, actually more impressive in the reduced dose uh, protocol. So the conclusion from the testing low-dose study was that in patients with IgA nephropathy, a six to nine months course of oral methylprednisolone reduced the major kidney outcomes by 47% and kidney failure by 41%. And the incidence of serious adverse events uh, is really mainly driven by the full dose protocol and not by the uh, reduced dose protocol. So for uh, the treatment of uh, IgA nephropathy, apart from corticosteroid, uh, some of the ancillary agents that have been used before, such as antiplatelet agents, azathioprin, or CNI, rituximab, fish oil, and so on, were actually not recommended by KDGO. Uh, Mycophenolate, I have uh, briefly touched upon. This is a race-specific uh, or ethnicity-specific treatment because it was only found to be effective in Chinese patients, but not confirmed in non-Chinese patients. And the recommendations for using mycophenolate as a steroid sparing agent in patients who are considered, who can be considered for corticosteroid therapy actually came from uh, number one, a, a, an older paper from our group showing that patients who received mycophenolate actually fare better in terms of uh, survival, kidney survival versus control. And more recently, a study from the Nanjing group uh, showing that uh, mycophenolate combined with low-dose corticosteroid is actually non-inferior to full-dose corticosteroid in patients with proliferative changes on kidney biopsy. So if we come back to this guideline for uh, treatment of IgA nephropathy, uh, you would actually see that... Yes, of Sydney, two minutes. Okay. So as of 2021, there are actually no approved therapy for IgA nephropathy. Importantly, you would see that the consideration for enrollment into clinical trial uh, comes very early uh, uh, in the guideline. And I would just like to go over some of the uh, clinical trials that are available as a result of our improved understanding of the pathogenesis of IgA nephropathy as shown here by uh, combating B-cell or complement and so on. So these are some of the ongoing trials uh, in IgA nephropathy. There are just too many of them. The PROTECT trial is one of the trials using the same agents, Barsantan, with this design. And the week 36 results have been announced by Trevia, very impressive, impressively showing a huge reduction in proteinuria in the Barsantan group versus Episartan group. And I think this is one of the largest reduction in proteinuria in any of the uh, uh, IgA nephropathy trials. If Tacovan is using a small molecule inhibitor of factor B against the alternative pathway of a complement, and this is the initial result, short-term result presented in the ERA DTA meeting by John Barrett a few months ago, showing a reduction in proteinuria, but this is only from a small number of patients. Okay, so uh, the SYK inhibitor, probably I won't say anything about it because the paper is under submission, and but, but the uh, study was actually presented in the World Congress of Nephrology two years ago, showing a reduction in proteinuria, non-statistical difference, mainly in patients with baseline creatinine more than a gram a day. And I can't finish without saying anything about, um, about uh, 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 the SGLT2 inhibitor, uh, which was published by David Wheeler and KI uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, but I would like to caution you that uh, um, the 
uh, positive results were actually mainly driven by the unusually bad outcomes in the placebo group. So I think one would have to be careful about the use of SGLT2 inhibitors in IgA nephropathy. And the result, the KDCL does not recommend the use of SGLT2 inhibitor in IgA and patients without diabetes. I don't think I would have time to go into the third patient. Maybe I would, I should do it. How much time do I have? Maybe I will just uh, very quickly go to the third patient who actually presented with nephrotic syndrome and that uh, this patient actually uh, upon discharge uh, was actually uh, 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 given a paper for testing of the NTPLA2R. And now we know that the NTPLA2R uh, is actually a serum marker for membranous nephropathy. Uh, this is the original paper from Boston's group. And now we know that this is a highly specific uh, marker for this autoimmune disease, uh, idiopathic membranous nephropathy. And this is the, these are the conditions in which KDCO would recommend proceeding with treatment without a kidney biopsy. And one of them is actually a PLA2 antibody positive membranous nephropathy in the presence of normal GFR. So we have to remember that in patients who have a, a positive anti-PLA2R, they can actually uh, be having a membranous nephropathy. But this is only in the realm of patients with normal kidney function. For patients with abnormal kidney function, I think a biopsy is still required. So the patient actually underwent a kidney biopsy and they don't need to go through the features of membranous nephropathy, but just to highlight the fact that KDCO actually would now recommend a risk-based approach for the treatment of membranous nephropathy, mainly for patients with moderate risk, more than four grams a day of proteinuria, and with a PLA2 antibody level of at least 50. These patients can be considered for treatment with rituximab uh, or uh, some other agents. And the use of rituximab is really mainly coming from the mentor study published in the New England Journal, in which patients who received rituximab had a, uh, a much lower rate of relapse at 24 months. Uh, although the treatment uh, efficacy we see was actually uh, not different from the CNI group at 12 months. So the take home messages I want to give is that kidney biopsy is still the gold standard for diagnosing glomerular diseases, but there are some exceptions as, I, as I've highlighted. The treatment of glomerular diseases is definitely evolving, but in choosing a treatment, we should uh, choose a treatment that would avert the immediate morbidity from primary disease processes using induction therapy, for example, in patients with anchor associated vasculitis we should have a therapy that will prevent disease progression. This may uh, entail the use of multiple rounds of therapy or maintenance therapy or some second line agents. And lastly, we need to minimize the harmful effects of immunosuppression. I just want to close by showing you this picture taken at the very first controversy conference in Singapore back in 2017. And these are some of the members who are actively involved in the IGA and uh, 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 guideline update, Sean Barber for the prediction tool, uh, Rosanna Koppel from Italy, Hernan Tramachi from the MESC Oxford classification score update, uh, Liu Jingvan uh, being from China for the testing study, Charlie Arpers, John Barrett for the IGA and also Ritsuko Katafuchi. Okay, sorry, I'm over time, but thank you very much for your attention.